You folks asked for it. Here's the Azure Vault Masterclass that you've been waiting for. This is footage from my tyrannical AV Plus 20 that we timed on the fourth week. And don't you worry, I will cover both the fortified and tyrannical perspectives of this key. I'll tell you everything about the bosses and the mobs as dangerous. So even though it's tyrannical footage, it's applicable to both affixes. A lot of people don't like this dungeon because I think that all around it's a very technical dungeon. Um, and in Fortify and Tyrannical Weeks, you guys can see that we open up with this pool. It's a double pool here. And some people are very afraid of this pool because they think that, oh, the lashes will deal insane amount of damage if they get their cast off, which is kind of true. But what we are doing here, and you'll notice once I group them up, I basically did a shockwave to stun. And I'm holding my AoE fear because I know they're going to channel again and they're about to channel. And, you know, if they just do a single cast, I don't do anything, but you can see our AoE fear towards the end. Um, on a fortified week, some people actually last this double pull, and I think it's actually pretty efficient. As long as you group up the mobs, you can kind of uh, make sure that none of the cast goes off. But the lashes, they do a, a stacking cast of that vapors, right, which basically trucks, especially on fortified week. So you need to kind of like um, assign interrupts if possible. What you can do is you can get this like Wikora auto marker. You can search it for. Um, on, on Wago, and I'm sure you guys can find it. And before the key, just assign someone to a symbol each so they know exactly which one to kick. And you guys might be wondering, like, why the hell did he pull those mobs back in the room, right? Like, why did he pull, like, the triple pull? Possible, but I think it's very dangerous. And I know some of you don't pull that Lashes pack here um, because it's not a default punk route, and I'll explain why in a bit. Azir Vaults is a very, very tight timer. Some people think that Azir Vaults needs to be given maybe an additional two or three minutes. And I kind of agree, like you need to you need to do something out of the ordinary to time a high Azure Vault key. And this pool here, I think all of you are familiar, right? Normally you just take these lashes here, kick the vapors, make sure you don't awaken the drakes. But what we're gonna do next is uh, gonna start to differ from maybe some of the routes that you guys are familiar with in uh, parks. And you can see that we are edging towards here on the left. And normally people just jump down, right? I'm telling the party to wait here because what we're gonna do is gonna pull the lashes and the trees here. And the rationale here, I guess, is we are trying to skip mobs that are inefficient where we cannot do as much cleave and it's very dangerous. And you can see that during this transition where we're moving across the ledge to these three vapors, some of them got their cast off and it kind of hurts. But the idea of me tagging those additional lashes in the first room and the lashes here alongside this tender is because I want to skip the entire of the second ring. And you guys will see what I'm doing later. But the most important thing to know in this pack is that, look, the tender will do a cast that turns you into a tree, a sprout, and there's an AoE around you. If the healer dispels you when there's anyone else in your party in your circle, they will then also turn into a tree. This whole area, this next area, very simple. Just make sure somebody watches the kicks or interrupts on the tenders. Uh, the seedlings, you know, the little saplings, sorry. They don't do much. Some people pull the saplings in alongside the boss, right? So you kill the tenders first and then you do the saplings with the boss, possible. Uh, but since we're going around the room, I'm just like chain pulling them, right? And the reason why I chose to talk about Azure Vaults on a tyrannical affix is because you know, there's, there's a certain amount of wisdom that um, it is equally hard on Fortify and Tyrannical. So as we go through all the individual mobs, I'm going to tell you what each mob does and what you need to pay attention to. But even on Fortify weeks, like this room is very easy, right? Just kick the tenders and you're fine. And just don't die to, you know, the explosions when the saplings die. The boss, I would say, is very important for a tank. Uh, you need to know how to position the tank um, and the boss such that it cleaves as much of those like trees that it sprouts as possible. Because on tyrannical keys, especially if you leave a single or two, you know, of those like trees up, when he does his red white AOE, it might be a one shot. So we tend to ask people to hold defensives until the moment where you see like, okay, there's multiple of those like trees that are left up and we didn't manage to clear them, then you need to you know, play it safe. So I'm going to forward footage here because I don't want to waste your time. We awaken the boss, uh, we pull the boss, and you can see I'm just awaiting for those swirlies to spawn here, right? The moment I see the swirlies and I start analyzing the situation, I realize that, okay, there's an easy cut here of a group of four trees, right? So I'm going to turn the boss around 
and make sure that he gets this AOE corner on the four of them. Um, you can also go for other patterns, but the idea is that you want to clear, in my opinion, as a tank, if possible, clear at least four. Normally, I find that to be like a really good number because if you can clear that, it just means that, you know, amongst the five of you, you can definitely clean out the entire room, right? So again, look at knockback here. Something dangerous for tanks is to note is also sometimes don't kill the saplings that are about to die as you are trying to clear the trees because what might happen is, um, you know, they they burst on where you want to stand in order to clear the tree. So you might be careful, you need to hold DPS there. Also, another thing about tanks is that when the saplings all uh, come to life, they would instantly go to your healer because of healing aggro. Ideally, you get someone to kind of tricks or MD to you, the mobs, but it's tricky at a point. So as a tank, try and save like AOE um, stuff at a point. You guys can see he trucked me with that uh, infused strike and it's basically like a kind of like a painful dot that you just need to kind of watch. And you can see the Kono is way bigger than what it seems. Let me rewind a little. All right, look at this Kono. This Kono is way bigger than it seems because not only did we get the four of them here, we got these as well. So we got six of them. The Kono is actually really, really huge. So if possible, like if you know over time, you know, you get a very good sense of how wide the Kono is, you can actually do like some really, really pretty amazing stuff as a tank to just make everyone's life that much easier, right? You can see again, um, the, the the those little saplings are going like they're making a beeline for my healer, right? And meanwhile, I'm just trying to like save thunderous raw or something like that uh, to try and just get aggro. But this boss, other than that, pretty simple. It's a tank fight. You need to kind of cut trees, right? So again, analyze the situation. Where can I cut four trees? Well, it's a direct line here. If you guys can see it, so I'm gonna cut four of them. Um, I should have pop wall there. That was actually very dangerous for me. Like I should have pop wall before he did the infuse strike. Uh, but I survived, that's what matters. I think I use a health pot there. Ah, I missed out one tree, so that's kind of unfortunate. Like the, the blast is wide, but not as deep as it seems. So it's a bit finicky. But if you do it enough times, like you kind of like, you know, you get really good at breaking trees out, basically. You guys can see we have one tree up. So um, ideally, like everyone pops a cooldown when he does his big AoE blast. So my healer is trying to top everyone up here. Uh, he unfortunately dies to something, I can't remember what. I think it's the explosive burst on the saplings. Probably got clipped. Um, and so we know that, okay, in the next um, you know, 7%, we just need to burn the boss. So I pop a uh, spell block there so the infuse strike doesn't hurt me, which I should have done way earlier, actually. Uh, but thankfully, we kill the boss, right? And let me just forward here because the next part is you know, pretty much RP, traveling, this part, you guys have seen it, right? Like you just travel down the stairs. Uh, the default park route is basically to skip all the annoying little mobs here that the whelps will awaken and that's the right thing to do. Um, and you pull these two mobs here, right? This is the park route. Uh, these two mobs, elementals, they don't do much, right? They are probably like the least uh, dangerous mobs. They do something called like um, a sleep, a waking bane sleep, right? And if you don't kick it while someone sleeps, and if there's no other AOE around, it doesn't really do much. These two mobs are technically inefficient to do though because it's like two mobs and there's nothing else to cleave it with. So let me tell you a like for like replacement for these mobs if you want to drop them from your route. You, but it means that you need to use an invis pod or a shroud to get past them. Um, and the way to get back the same count is in the second boss room, later I'll show you, you can tag two other guards in the far corner. All right, so this is the first ring of the Azure Vault. And on a fortified week, this is like probably where a lot of people wipe because the the timer on Azir Vaults is so tight that it forces you to be efficient in your pull here. Like you cannot take too long and pull them one by one. It just takes forever. So you need to go for you need to go for big plays here, right? So you can see that I'm actually going for three furies. And keep in mind it's tyrannical, but it's a raging week as well. So technically, like you can see those eye shots, those shots actually like absolutely just chunk me, right? The piercing shots. And, you know, on my part, maybe I could have walled, right? So you can see before the shots land, I actually walled. So this is a huge cooldown from a warrior. But even then, it chunked me, right? Massive chunk. Um, I have also spell block here. I think I might have died here, actually. Uh, but I also have spell block. And I was actually trying to save spell block to the very end when maybe um, the mobs were uh, doing their raging thing. So I popped spell block here because I knew that the Furies are coming out. Uh, I could have stunned them here. I think I stunned. No, I didn't manage to stun. But I trinketed. And I trinketed and I died to the dot. You can see that 
I already have four stacks of the dot on me. It's it's actually really painful. Um, the better play, don't be like me, obviously. Like you could have stunned, right? I could have AOE shock. I could have shockwave this this cast. Uh, but I thought that you know I could live. And that was a mistake. And now I basically have to play catch up, right? So I, I died. My healer BS me real quick. I stunned the Furies because the worst thing that you want is the Furies to like, you can see he is about to, you know, do that frontal, right? You can see at this point, he's about to do, well, he's casting Arcane Fury. But after that, I feared them so that he doesn't get the cast of this piercing shot. And my Druid did something really good there, which is he disoriented the cast. So that's something that, you know, in a high fortified key, your party should try and help you basically stop the cast from going off because that thing absolutely chunks, right? And the problem is this Trasher behind you, he does this like stomp. And when he does that stomp, nobody can get in and help you like kind of CC or stop the Furies from going off. But this pool I love to do, even on fortified weeks. It's a very easy pool to do. It seems scary, but it's not scary because again, the Arcane Bolts, they kind of chunk you but if you pop big cooldowns, you should be fine. But once you basically rounded them all up, you can chain your um, AOE CCs, like we shockwave first. Um, you can see my fear is on 35 seconds, but my healer probably has disorient. Um, and the cards don't do much. And it's so important, so important that people are adventurous in the Azure Vaults because timer is just very tight. Again, the elementals, they don't do much. They do a Waking Bane, they do an Arcane Bolt cast, nothing much, right? The Curator does this like Swirlies that land that disorients you. That's pretty much nothing you need to really know. It casts Heavy Tome, doesn't really do much. So the most important thing about this ring, both rings, is actually um, if you have a mob that um, does the front door like the Furies, that is probably like the highest priority target to watch. Belize should never ever come across up to the front of the tank because they will instantly get one shot. So you can see there, I pop like spell reflect just to try and mitigate some magical damage, but it's the bleed and the frontals that kind of like just absolutely wrecks you, right? On four to five weeks. So you just need to be careful. If you have a rogue, they can probably like, you can see my rogue just basically stun the fury before the, the cast went off. So that's like MVP place. So if you guys have any form of stops, definitely help your tank out. It's a lot of damage. Uh, we skipped this entire ring, but let me explain the mobs here, right? Um, and, and while I'm mid-air, let me pause the footage. So you guys already know what the attendant does, the elemental does, they do nothing. The keeper, this mob, you see it uh, quite often in Azir Vaults, Vaults. And the keeper basically does condensed frost, which you can ignore. The most important thing to kick is the icy binding. Because if you don't kick the icy binding of the keeper, and if you use my plater profile, it will highlight the cast. If you don't kick the icy binding, it roots everyone. And those AOEs that is being spawned by, let's say, you know, the elementals or, you know, other forms of mobs, those will kill you. And um, you guys also see these two constructs here. These two constructs are actually really easy to tank. Uh, we're shrouding here, but let me talk about the two constructs. So the two constructs, they do, an, they do a bash. There is a frontal corner, and it will knock you off and knock you back uh, quite a certain distance. So if you are positioned at the edge, and he basically knocks you, you'll fly off to the middle and die, right? Or if you're at the side, he knocks you, you basically fly off to the side. But the good news is the moment they're channeling that blast frontal, they do not move, right? So they're, they are basically held in position. So you can sidestep them or basically just build enough distance by backpedaling and you should be okay. But I'm shrouding the second ring because like I told you guys, I feel like the mobs in this area are really inefficient. They are very spread out. There's a patrol that you need to watch. And the benefit is, if you did what I did at the start of dungeon, you pull additional lashes and additional tenders at the start, you can skip this entire ring. And if you don't have a roll, you can actually, you know, just invis pot through. That works as well. So we're coming to the second boss area. And um, what I'll say here is that the guards, they are very easy count. They do something called IC cutter. It's basically like some form of mini tank buster. You don't really need to care about it. Just make sure you have active, active mitigations running. Um, the most important thing you can see, I instantly focus the Keeper because the Keeper will cast Icy Binding. You can see there was an instant kick from the rope because we all know if Icy Binding goes off, you can see those Swirlies appearing on the ground. That is bad news because you literally can't avoid them. Um, and the Lieutenant is walking by and I'm basically going to attack the Lieutenant now. So the Lieutenant does two things, right? Firstly, he has this aura, this circular aura around him that buffs allies damage by 25%. 
So a lot of the mobs will start trucking me now. So when I pull them, you can see I instantly walled here. And he does something called a spell frost breath, which is basically magical damage. And that is why, like, you know, my my wall basically also helped mitigate the damage. He does Icy Cutter, which is basically a tank buster, physical tank buster. Make sure you have mitigations. But doing the Lieutenant alone is definitely not efficient. You want to try and cleave the Lieutenant alongside other uh, things. And you usually don't go for a gigantic pool with the Lieutenant. Like all the mobs will be amplified by 25%. It would just chunk you. So I'm going to follow a little here because I don't want to waste your time, right? These masterclasses video are just supposed to make you an expert and not literally waste your time so I can get more ad revenue or something like that. Uh, but before that, sorry, I'm just rewinding here. You guys can see as I spin the camera around, these are the two mobs. These guards, these two guards here are the two mobs that I talked about where if you want to skip the elementals earlier, right, heading down from the first boss room, you tag those two uh, guards there and they make up the count like for like, right? It's the exact count like for like. So that's something that you can do. You can see I instantly move over and basically focus target on this keeper because I see binding is the only reason why you die here. Really, literally the only reason why you die here. Um, and let's talk about the second boss while we kind of wait for ads to die, right? I think a lot of people struggle with this boss initially because um, when the first week rolled around, everyone saw the ads spawn in that circular pattern. Everyone's like, okay, let's spread out and let's go and kill all of them. Uh, by the way, you can leap away from this gigantic arcane cleave, which is a very heavy hitting tank buster at high keys. Uh, you can mobility away. You can see I leapt away from that, and that basically saves damage. Um, the image actually scales with tyrannical keys. So make sure you kick that, else it's really painful. And when he dies, it spawns ice uh, stuff on the ground, so you just need to run out. You can see the arcane cleave there is massive. And the arcane cleave, by the way, is a frontal. So if you're melee and you're cleansing with the tank for some reason or the other and Arcane Cleave goes out, you are in for very, very bad times. Okay, the most important thing about this boss, let me tell you, is you must pre-agree with your group beforehand to move together as a group. Because if you don't, and someone is standing in Africa or Narnia as like some ranged players like to play, your healer can't reach you on the other side of the room. And if you haven't noticed, basically everyone is taking ticking damage in this phase. So it's imperative that we all agree how are we going to maneuver? Are we going to move left clockwise? What are we going to do, right? So before this key started, we agreed we're going to move clockwise. So you can see that my healer is literally in range of everyone. And then if you can do that, it literally is a rinse and repeat. There's a few tricks, like I said, you can do, which is like, oh, you can trap the ad and ignore the ad and stuff like that. Uh, but the ad really hurts on high keys, right? So you can see, oh, Look at the tank buster, right? You saw, okay, just look at this tank buster here. Look at how much damage it does. So I have my active mitigation up. That's pretty much about it. Active mitigation, ignore pain. It chunks me to about 25% of my health. So ideally you want to save like big mitigation so I can cleave or jump away like I did earlier in this video. Uh, just for trundles, other than that, you know, I pretty much covered everything you need to know about the second boss, right? So I won't waste your time, go to forward here. Forwarding here, you can skip all the ads, by the way, you can CC all the ads, just ignore them, that's entirely possible. Um, and you can see like, we have just been very, very disciplined in terms of moving together as a group. Uh, boss about to die, I'm just gonna forward here, folks, like nothing adventurous happens here. Forwarding, forwarding, ah, okay. Here, boss gonna die here, I'm gonna stop here. Okay, so boss dies here. You can see Arcane Cleave almost kills my um my melee there. So the next thing to do is this gigantic pull, right? I'm on fast forward here because I again I don't want to waste your time. Uh you can see this breaker, right? Just know that the frogs and all the mobs here, they are all harmless, right? The most dangerous mob is the breaker because the breaker does like an AoE stomp. This one, the, the bestial raw. Sorry, I got it wrong. The bestial raw is an AoE wide unavoidable damage. Other than that, the frogs literally just jump around on swirlies. And if your healer puts a vortex on them or some form of like CCs, group CCs, um, they will prevent the frogs from jumping, right? And there's also like tiny looter mobs that also exist in this room. Your objective is to pull big. On four to five weeks, you go ham here because this is where you make up for efficient time, right? So you can see once we clear the entire first room, I dash off to pick up the rest of the frogs the breaker, which is the dangerous mob. And I go all the way to the end of the corridor 
before the next breaker that is in the room, right? You can technically do two breaker, but it starts to get a bit messy. This is by itself already a gigantic pool. Um, and what I'll say is that in terms of bloodlust timing, it depends on fortified or uh, tyrannical. If it's tyrannical, I tend to save it for bosses. If it's fortified, dude, I definitely use fortified um, bloodlust at the start. And maybe when Bloodlust is back up, I probably use it at the one of the ring pools, right? Maybe the more difficult Fury pools is where I use Bloodlust. Uh, but it really depends where uh, you use Bloodlust depending on the affix that is tyrannical or, or, or fortified. You can see, again, we pulled the breaker. Everyone is kind of cleaving off the breaker because the moment the breaker dies, this pool becomes really easy. But this pool is arguably like the easiest pool on high um, on high for the fight tyrannical keys because nothing is happening. So before the third boss, we pull the two breakers. Again, you see them in action. They don't do anything. They do an AOE wide. Just make sure your healer is topping everyone up. They do a shoulder charge, which I believe you can melt or maybe a feign death. I'm not sure about feign death. But anyway, they charge you. They do damage to you, which is why uh, your healer needs to top everyone up. Also, when they charge you, they also knock you back flying. So don't stand with your back against like, you know, the bottomless pit behind you, right? Behind the book. Um, because you'll just fall to your death. Okay. And then we come to Telesh Grey Wing. So until this point, you guys will have a good understanding of all the mobs, everything dangerous that you need to be aware of. But Telesh Grey Wing and Umbra Skull is where keys are bricked. And I purposely chose a tyrannical key so I can explain to you guys why we do things a certain way how to position the bosses and what's important when you take them on. So the first thing to kind of agree on is, are you moving clockwise or counterclockwise? So before I pull the boss, I told the party that I am going clockwise, right? So everyone knows how to position versus the boss. Um, and you can see the moment the ice puddle drops, everyone's supposed to get out. A tip for you guys, I'm a tank and I don't practice this, but a tip for uh, the DPS and healers, because I hear from them, it's, when the ice puddle is about to tick down, right? You wait until the very last second and you start moving or jumping out. You pre-jump the ice puddles. And if you do so, you will only take one tick of the ice puddles because those things actually hurt on Tyrannical, right? And actually don't drop icicles that is overlapping with your partners or your friends. They will get one shot. Um, and also one very important thing. He does something called Icy Devastator. This beam that uh, is he or she is or it is about to do after this um, icy bombs. And obviously you guys already know how to do this, like just conserve space here, right? But look at this icy devastator that's going out. And it's important to talk about this. This icy devastator, you can feign death, you can immune it, um, you can go greater invis, I believe, and can shadow mel and stuff like that. But do not use it on the very first icy devastator because you will desync the boss's Q cast and the Q cast just becomes very, very much harder to do. So don't ever use Vanish or Shadow Melt on the first Icy Devastator. This is the second one, so uh, it's fine, right? You can just eat it. But you guys know the drill, like spread out uh, when Icy Devastator goes out. If you're Rogue Vanish, if you're Night Elf, Shadow Melt, um, basically just drop aggro and, and you will instantly cancel the Icy Devastator. So less things for your healer to heal, more DPS your healer can do. And trust me, you need all the DPS you can get. And you can see Icy Devastator going out again. Um, and bombs are coming out. So it's rinse repeat, right? It's a very technical dungeon. And you can see we are basically maximizing our space here. Um, and the healer needs to top everyone up before this blast. Because this absolute zero kind of chunks, you can see on the tyrannical key. So healer needs to top everyone up, standing in the airflow. And then we know you have frost bombs again. So you're dropping frost and rinse and repeat, folks. That is it. I just going to fast forward here. Uh, you can see like, wow, well, my you know, range DPS died there because really the ice puddles, they just hurt. They absolutely hurt, right? You guys can see like my, my hunter dying there. It's just the ice puddles. He took two ticks of damage on a plus 20 tyrannical and he died. You need to take only one tick of damage. Um, and sometimes it's worth even saving like personal health pots for that moment because it really, really chunks. Cannot stress this enough, right? Um, you can see like my healers are starting to, to move at the one second mark. Because, because he just wants to take one tick of the of this uh, frost bomb. And my hunter dies here, unfortunately. So we just need to survive this next bit because the ice will start despawning. Some people thought that the ice will not despawn, right? But 
uh, we now know that the eyes will despawn. So as long as you conserve space, you will never run out of space. It's not a DPS check per se. I would say it's more like a healing check on Tyrannical. And also kind of like a logic check by DPS and healers not to take more than one tick of the IC puddle damage. So that's the first major, major wall. Well, I would call it the second major wall in Azir Vaults because the first major wall is probably those ads I told you about in the ring, right? Those are dangerous. But Grey Wing is probably the next big wall. And finally, Umbra Scout. I think a lot of people hate this boss, including myself, right? When I've, out of all the bosses they created in Dragonflight, this one scares me the most because sometimes I feel like I'm at the mercy of everyone. Um, so let me rewind here a little because there's a few tech I want to talk about. Uh, so when you pull Umbra Scout, I really want to thank the boss like at the side of the room. And I talked about this during a one minute Mythic Plus tip video. If you tank the boss um, to the side of the room, you are restricting where the crystals will spawn, those ads you need to kill. And if you don't kill those ads, they explode. They put a dot on everyone, everyone will die. So the reason why you pull it to the edge of the room is because you want to make sure that the crystals spawn close to the boss. That way, the melees don't have to run all over the place to try and kill them, right? So you're restricting the, the space where the crystals can spawn, which is basically any advantage you can have. And he does something called Dragon Strike, which, you know, as a prop warrior, you can reflect. And then he does this basically frontal beam that, you know, you can also make sure you dodge. But I normally wait for the frontal beam to go up before I reposition the boss though, because of the slow. Sorry, I'm rewinding again. You can see he turns around to do Crystalline Roar, right? I, at this point, then use Heroic Leap, or if you are other tanks, you can use your mobility spells at this moment to basically move up to this cliff here. And there's a couple of good reasons why I'm taking him on the cliff. Number one, all the... And by the way, I'm going to, um, I, I basically walk this Dragon Strike. Dragon Strike kind of hurts because big frontal damage followed by a dot over time, right? So basically you can see that by tanking it here, the orbs, these tiny orbs on the ground, they will make it very, 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 very difficult for them to try and climb up the slope to reach you as a tank. Because I'm sure you're aware as a tank, there are times where all the ops conspired to go on you, right? All of them suddenly turn their attention on you. And some people say that it's healing threat. Some people say it's depending on how many stacks of this movement speed debuff that you see on screen that determines whether the ops chase you or not. I don't think there's conclusive proof. My healer thinks it's healing threat and I kind of agree that's probably more plausible. Um, but my point is as a tank, if you tank it up here, uh, the ops make it very, very hard. Uh, it makes it very hard for the ops to kind of reach you. And um, also, it kind of, you know, limits the amount of spread where the crystal spawn. You can see like at 75%, the first wave of crystal spawns and I'm just helping out in melee range. The next thing you will see is at the bottom, all the crystals have already basically died because the boss is so close to the wall, there's no real space to spawn the crystals and that kind of helps. So my idea here is that I've not used Bloodlust. I basically told the DPS that, all right, at the 75% mark for the crystals and I reflect this, yeah, I reflected this. And I told them, you know, at the 75% first wave of crystals, we use our own personal offensive cooldowns. At the 50% mark where he spawns the second wave, then we use Bloodlust. And by then, the third wave of crystals at 25%, people should have their big cooldowns up. But yeah, Dragon Strike is kind of scary. And you can see that um, over here, the ops are starting to chase me, right? So I'm trying to run out, I'm trying to run out. And I'm trying to run out and not cleanse because I'm abusing Thundering, right? What do I mean by that? So rewinding the footage here. You can see that I have 10 stacks here, right? But thundering is about to happen. You can see the moment thundering happens, thundering allows you to ignore any form of movement speed debuff. If you read the tooltip for the affix, it literally says, when you have thundering, you cannot be slowed, right? Because it will be unfair to you that you can't cleanse in time. So I use thundering to move the boss out to the open away from all the ops that they're trying to trap me. And here, I know that at the 50% mark is about to come, right? So I quickly move the boss to the edge of the room. Um, and, and this roar is coming. I don't know if I'll make it out in time. So I walk there, precautionary, like precautionary uh, defensive. But 50% this is where it spawns, right? So I'm trying to move the boss to the side of the room. Arguably, I could have moved faster. So I restrict the ad spawn. But over here, you can see we instantly pop that last. And this is where like, um, I would say comp is quite important in Azure Vaults. Some people think, uh, some people think that if you take um, three melees DPS to this dungeon, you're gonna have a very bad time on those crystals. And I think I kind of concur. I feel like you need at the very bare minimum one range 
Or you can be like us, we took two range, a hunter and a shadow priest. And the shadow priest can kind of like mass dot all the ads, right? So that's kind of like their forte. Um, but as a tank, I think the most important thing I can advise you, other than, you know, trying to bait the orbs um, to one side before you move out or you leap out so that it kind of gives everyone some breathing room. Uh, that's the first tip. The second tip here is that for every dragon strike, you want to have something up, right? Like a shield wall, um, some reflect. Those are critical. But once you get past the three waves of ads, you know, it's kind of it's kind of okay. So this is the final wave, right? Like we know this is the final wave. And I know there's one literally beside the boss. And I'm trying to get there, right? I'm trying to get there. And as a tank, you also need to contribute in this phase because the DPS check can be very tight on very high tyrannical keys. Like you can see now 20 here. Um, and you can see like all the ops are sur surrounding me. I'm basically telling the Druid healer to spell me on cooldowns. And Druid healers, Druid healers are very, very good for this boss because all the all the Druids out there, they can shape shift. And when they shape shift, they lose their movement speed debuff that you see on screen right here. So they can movement speed away by just shape shifting and then they save your cleanse or dispel for the tank so that the tank always can get the dispel um, on cooldown and run away from ops. So once you kill the third wave of ads, it's smooth sailing and you are timing this key if you've done everything I told you to. So I would say that Azir Vault sounds like a challenging, challenging dungeon, but in fact, it's not that terrible if you get the right comp. Like I said, range is really important for the final boss. And also, if you keep in mind like how to deal with those nasty frontal shards from those fury mobs, those are also another killer. But you gotta go aggressive on pulling the mobs. Because if you don't, you're going to run out of time because of just how long, you know, this particular boss takes. It takes forever, right? Because you're going to swap to add, swap to boss, swap to add, swap to boss, and then everyone moves so slowly. Challenging, very challenging dungeon. But hopefully this masterclass helps you time as your vault keys for both Fortified and Tyrannical. If you have any questions, post them in the comments below. I'll try and get back to you. And with that, I hope you enjoyed this guide. If you did, do subscribe to the channel. I will have the masterclass videos for every single dungeon for mythic plus in dragonflight so stay tuned to that good luck in your keystones i also stream on twitch so you can feel free to swing by to hang out i hope to see you soon take care everyone